in the first episode of Season 3 of The Owl House. After spending weeks in the human realm with the main cast, Hunter was possessed by Belos, and it was a tense moment. Hunter, leader of the Emperor's Coven, raised by the Emperor to be totally obedient in all things, and fanatical believer of the Titan's will and the right of Belos to rule, now torn between his old loyalties and his new friends. For a moment, it felt like it could go either way. However, with strength of character and the many lessons he's learned and the support of his friends, Hunter managed to fight off Belos' influence, completing his character arc from a villain to a hero. And that is what should have happened. But that isn't what really actually happened, is it? Hunter has been established as a Grimwalker, a sort of revived clone of a person magic thing. It's not too specific. In the season 2 episode Hollow Mind, we get this revelation from Belos. We are then shown throughout the rest of the episode and in the season finale that Hunter has chosen to betray Belos what's implied to be A, 100% of the times he's been brought back, and B, hundreds, possibly thousands of times. Meaning that this scene here, in thanks to them, that wasn't his character overcoming the shadows of his past or breaking through his brainwashing or even changing allegiance. This was an inevitability. This is what Hunter was always going to do because he's done it hundreds, potentially thousands of times before. And the path he's on with the Outhouse squad is the exact same path of rebellion. This is the fundamental flaw of Hunter's entire character, and him being a Grimwalker. A flaw so enormous that one could argue, as I would and have, that it utterly breaks him as a character to the point that he barely even is one. He's essentially a Mary Sue, a character who is liked by everyone for no discernible reason in spite of the many horrendous things he's done to them which are never questioned by the story, who is the most special person to ever exist to the point of it being a massive detriment to his character and the characters of those around him, and with inherent moral virtues that cannot be shaken by environment, upbringing, abuse, or those around him. At least, if he wasn't a Grimwalker, his shift from serving the Emperor's Coven to the Owl House crew would have meant something since it would be a choice he's making of his own accord. Even if he was the only good Grimwalker, he would still be making a choice of his own accord. Now that we learn that it's a choice he's made thousands of times, we learn it's not really a choice, but his inherent morality which cannot change which dictates this. And for this, we have sacrificed every other member of the main cast's time in the spotlight and their character development for a character whose morality was always going to arrive at these conclusions anyway. Incredible. It's utterly redundant to the point where one has to wonder what the point of his character even is anymore. Well, I know what the purpose of his character was meant to be, and I also know why it wasn't brought to fruition. So if you want to know how a character with the absolute most potential out of nearly the entire cast of the outhouse was squandered into a borderline worthless, completely superfluous, bastardized version of himself, then come along for this emotional roller coaster disguised as a video essay. Hello, and welcome to the second part of a video series in which I scream at both the Owl House fandom and the producers of the series to stop punching themselves in the mouth, which I'm informally calling the Hunter Saga, because I hate him, with a burning passion not matched by a billion suns going supernova. How's that for an introduction? Now that was last video. This video is going to be something quite different, ideally shorter, a lot angrier, and straight to the point. I would add a script of about 10,000 words for this video initially, which then turned into about 18,000 words, and a lot of it was unnecessary and went into a lot more new points I had about Hunter upon watching the second season because this season is a mess. I could go into how I interpret the Born and the Isles to be an analogy of the Americas before the arrival of Europeans and how Belos' regime is analogous to the colonialism of Native Americans, how the Hell Willow and Co managed to get into the rafters, Seriously, how we, how how you you dropped you were dropped onto the deck and Darius was watching you and hitting you every time you used magic. How how did you get up there? Were you up there to begin with, or did you climb up there in the two seconds Hunter was distracted? L literally, how the f how Hunter is in either scenario a white savior because everyone around him is utterly incompetent to the point of actual idiocy, and the only character who isn't a complete idiot towards him is Amity, the one other white character, and how I believe that to be intentional, not because of any racial bias, but rather borne out in the fact that their character arcs are intended to be similar because Hunter's arc is designed to be someone who was indoctrinated into a fascistic ideology, breaking free of that ideology, and how I know his character far better than any of his supposed defenders who wouldn't hear a damned word negatively said about their precious comfort character. But none of you came here for that, did you? you no, know, the title of this video is what you came here for, so let's get into that straight away. I will make another video, possibly, maybe, at a later date, if I feel like blasting Hunter it again because I'm annoyed. But right now, I don't. And you want to know why I don't? Because I'm angry. I could have had this video out months ago if I really wanted to. I've been busy with other projects and with real life stuff and work and all manner of things, but if I really wanted to, I could have gotten this video out months ago, 
I've deliberately not worked on it because working on it just angers and depresses me. However, these days, for me at least, being angry is better than being depressed. Anger gets shit done. So why am I angry? Let's get into what happened to the Owl House. So in case you're not familiar, let me give you a quick rundown. The Owl House was initially aiming to have three full-length seasons. We're going to use some basic maths here and I detest numbers, so we're going to be rounding all of them up and down to make this easier. Season 1 and 2 of the Owl House had roughly 20 episodes each, with each of those 20 episodes averaging about 20 minutes. 20 episodes times 20 minutes equals 400 minutes, which translates to roughly 6 hours and 40 minutes. Now, had season 3 followed this formula, it would have gotten roughly the exact same amount of time, give or take a special length episode. For the sake of easy maths though, we're going to be discounting any 45 minute long specials. This is also me being charitable to Disney because... There isn't really a scenario in which the Owl House having more content is bad, so I'm just going to assume that they were never going to make a 45 minute long finale in the first place. So that's 6 hours and 40 minutes. That is what season 3 should have gotten. Instead, what we got was 3 episodes, all of which were 45 minutes long. 3 specials, as they were called. That's a nice way of covering up the fact that they gutted more than half a season's worth of content. 45 minutes times 3 episodes comes up to about 135 minutes, which translates to 2 hours and 15 minutes. Now, you'll have to forgive me for flaunting my high education, but 2 hours and 15 minutes is a lot less than 6 hours and 40 minutes. In fact, let's calculate that difference, shall we? 400 minutes minus 135 minutes equals 265 minutes. The 265 is how much of a difference there was and therefore how much less content the third season has. Translating that into hours, and you get 4 hours and 20 minutes. Roughly. Again, I hate maths. But hey, if you call those three episodes specials, it sounds a lot nicer, doesn't it? Just ignore the fact that the first season literally has one third the length of the last two seasons. So you might be sat there thinking, okay, that's a shame, but that's just season three, to which I have to respond, no. That's not at all how this works. This impacted season two. Think about it. Let's use Hunter, shall we? Stick with the theme of this miniseries. You have a character who has a two season long character arc. A villain to hero. Classic stuff. You look at how much time you've got to work for this character. Two full seasons. Six hours and 15 minutes times two. That's just over 13 hours. You can work with that. You can put in moments that you need to have with him to let his character and ideology develop organically. Maybe he has a few moments of genuine doubt before devolving back into his villainous tendencies. Before he sees the full damage of what he's done. Maybe he even ends up in the human world with the heroes while still being a villain at the end of season two. Or maybe a more in-depth storyline about it in the demon realm. Who knows, the possibilities are endless. There's enough time to get what you need for him, and as well as to make sure that every other character gets their chance in the spotlight and that their relationships with Hunter are organic and meaningful and definitely not being completely forced in an organic manner. And then you learn, you're not getting the full 13 hours. You're getting just under 9. Which means you now lack 4 full hours which you were using to balance everything out. So you have to cut corners. People just believe Hunter without question, because questions take time and we don't have time. Imagine you work in retail, and you're the one cleaning up the shop after a day of work. You get, normally, say, six hours to do so? It takes a while, but you manage to get everything in order in that time. You do a proper job of it. You sweep the floors, you take out the garbage, you clear up spillages, you do a good job of it. And then, after a year of this, you're told that in the following year, you're not getting six hours to do this anymore. You're getting two to do all of this in. You're now going to lack four full hours, two thirds of the time to do your job. So you spend the next year trying to get better at cleaning up much faster because if you can't do this in two hours by next year, you don't have a job anymore. So you try to find shortcuts, sweep a little bit less thoroughly, try to hide stains rather than cleaning them up, stuff that you hope people won't notice because it saves you time. And then by next year, you can make the place look clean inside two hours, but you're not cleaning it up thoroughly. You're doing the best you can with what little time you have. You're hiding the mess because you don't have the time to deal with it. And that is the equivalent of what is happening with season 2 and 3 of The Owl House. When season 2 was in production, everyone working on the show knew they weren't going to be getting a full third season. This is a matter of public record, but we'll get into it later. But because they knew that this was happening, it meant that they had to cut corners in season 2, just so that they could get season 3 to wrap things up in an at least semi-finished manner. With Hunter, they just sort of hope that you don't pay attention to the whole every Grim Walker chooses to betray Belos thing, because that makes it easier for Hunter to turn against Belos. Having him be the first Grim Walker to betray Belos might take time. So, uh, every time it is. That's the charitable interpretation, anyway. Because if Grim Walkers were always, and they'd always 100% chose to betray Belos DL before the third season got cut, then Hunter was just a fundamentally flawed character from the beginning, and the writing is just terrible by default. But regardless of if that part is true or not, you can see the impact elsewhere. The arc that was required for Hunter took up so much time that he essentially became the main character. 
overshadowing Luce and Amity and rendering Willow and Gus basically is non-existent with no other purpose in the series other than propping him up. Something which might not have happened if there was an extra four hours laying about that could have been used to give them story arcs or episodes focusing on them, or even giving them meaningful interactions with Hunter. I've checked, Willow barely even talks to the guy. They converse in one episode of season two and that's it. I have no idea where Huntlow fans are getting it from. The haircut scene from season three, I guess? It's a shame they don't talk or have any meaningful emotional connections or, you know, talk about the fact that Hunter kidnapped her for a fascist autocracy to force her into military service against her will. That would take time and we don't have that. Just acknowledge that Willow seemed to forgive Skara on account of her being on the Flyer Derby team in Season 2, even though Willow's only previous interactions with Skara were her being alongside Bosha, her biggest child of bully. Hope that that conveys the idea that Willow can forgive people, even in spite of that being against nearly every aspect of her established character in relation to Amity that we know about, and will acknowledge it Season 3. Just don't think about it too much, and away we go. We'd love to show you that Willow isn't a character we had to completely gut to make any of this happen, but we just don't have the time. So you can see how this is a bit of an issue, right? And to all the Hunter fans who are already preparing essays about how he's a soft boy and this all makes sense, you should not have to, and if this show had been given the time that it needed, you would not have to. That's the f***ing problem here. So how did we end up in a situation where the season got cut to begin with? Money! Thank you for watching. Alright fine, you want some more in-depth reason why? Fine, but I'm going to warn you right now, we're about to get very political. We're going to get into the bowels of contemporary US politics, and for legal reasons, I need to specify that I cannot prove beyond any reasonable measure at this time that that is what happened. That's a legal disclaimer. In my opinion, this is what happened. But I am bloody confident that this is what happened. Like I said before, to make the long story short, the answer is money. To give the long and vastly more accurate answer that might actually be of use to people, I need to go deep into contemporary American politics, world history, economic and political theory, geopolitics, and how all of these things are inextricably linked to one another in such a way that you can't get rid of one from the other. It's simply not possible. Now, those things might sound boring or too complicated to you, I'll do my best to keep things simple to understand. It's going to get in-depth and complicated, but this is where the truth of what happened to the outhouse really rests, more so than anywhere else, more so than any one individual company or country. So if you want to know why things ended up the way that they did and you want to learn how we can stop shows like this from being cancelled again, this right here is where you need to pay attention. Throughout history, media has been known to impact the minds and hearts of people and influence how they think and interact with the world. It can be used to tell stories of the oppressed, political intrigue, and make people think about the world that they live in and what world they want to see. My favourite example of this has always been Star Trek, portraying an immensely optimistic outlook for the future of humanity that celebrated humanity as a whole. Star Trek inspired people to become doctors or scientists. Celebrities like Whoopi Goldberg credited the series for making her believe that she could be an actor, something that was a lot more difficult for a black woman to do in the 1960s due to Nichelle Nicole's portrayal of the character of Nyota Uhura. And when Whoopi Goldberg went on to become an actor, playing Guinan in The Next Generation and beyond. Take that idea. Multiply it by a thousand or a million and you can see the impact that media can have on people. And there have been people who realise this and don't want that to happen. In England, the most famous example that we have is the Long Parliament, which was where Oliver Cromwell banned theatre, music and Christmas because he was a f***ing pantomime villain, because he saw them as vices that distracted people from religion and he, as the leader of a religious movement known as Puritanism, didn't want people, quote, straying from their religious paths. You know, the ones he claimed to lead. Another example I like is the book 1984, which was banned in various nations around the world, a notable one being the Soviet Union under Stalin, and the most recent one being Belarus in May 2022. I wonder why hyper-authoritarian fascist regimes with hyper-surveillance networks who crack down on dissidents and use language and philosophies which are based on freedom in nature as justification for tyranny would want to ban a book which depicts a hyper-authoritarian fascist regime with hyper-surveillance networks who crack down on dissidents and use language and philosophies which are based on freedom in nature as justification for tyranny as bad. I can't imagine why myself. Sarcasm aside, it's pretty simple. Authoritarians like authoritarianism. If a book which is anti-authoritarian is released, it may lead to the anti-authoritarian sentiment in authoritarian nations growing. It challenges the status quo, which makes maintaining it harder. This is also why a lot of authoritarian states have underclasses, scapegoats basically. Now that we understand this, we can move the focus to the United States since the Owl House is made by Disney and Disney operates primarily in the US. 
Now, we need to set up a timeline because this is where things start to get pretty confusing, but a timeline will help us to make the connections we need in order to understand the full scale of things. This timeline is going to begin in 2016. If you're wondering why we're starting this far back, it's pretty simple. But what happened in the past still impacts the present day. I think a lot of people forget this and assume that politics happens in some sort of a vacuum. Whereas in reality, events from hundreds if not thousands of years can still impact the present day. But this timeline, we're beginning with the election of Donald Trump to the President of the United States, because it's easier to get the point across. Donald Trump is an extremely aggressive, extremely bigoted, extremely authoritarian president. His rhetoric has influenced his political party, the Republicans, extensively ever since he won the nomination to become the Republican candidate. The man has done so many things that I can't even begin to go over all of them. But suffice it to say, his rhetoric and actions have helped to normalize far-right, conservative, bigoted, and isolationist politics within the United States and globally. The second point on this timeline is in 2018, in which Florida Floridian Republican Ron DeSantis, this bastard, became governor of the state. DeSantis has been an outspoken supporter of Trump and follows many of his policies. The third point on this timeline will be the airing of the Owl House itself in January 2020. The fourth is the airing of Enchanting Grom Fight in August of the same year, where it became unambiguously clear that the series had LGBT themes and characters. The fifth point is the ending of the first season, also in August. Now this is where things start to get curious. Point six. The Owl House was officially announced to have been cut in October of 2021, through which the choice had already apparently been made before the season 1 airing of Agony of a Witch. During this time, Dana Terrace posted online and said that the reason for this was because a few people who oversaw what fit Disney's brand decided that the Owl House didn't. This confirms that they knew what was happening before season 2 even began proper production. Point 7. Jumps ahead to February of 2022. Ron DeSantis voiced his support for the Florida Parental Rights in Education Act, more commonly known as the Don't Say Gay Bill. A bill which forbade the teaching of any LGBT topics whatsoever in Floridian schools. Point 8. That he forces the Floridian legislature to write it into law in March of the same year. Point 9. This is where things start to get very interesting. It is revealed that Disney was actually financially supporting Ron DeSantis throughout most of this timeline. This came in the form of two donations, 50,000 in 2019 and a further 50,000 in 2021. So Disney is, while airing the Owl House since 2020 and until 2022, and its LGBT themes are abundantly clear and apparent and making a lot of positive headlines and ratings and coverage from it, it's also at the same time Funding a politician who has a zero record on voting for LGBT rights, is part of the party which has opposed LGBT rights for decades, and has been attempting to prevent schools from teaching LGBT topics in 2021. Fascinating. Point 10. Only after all of this is revealed and pointed out, Disney opposes the bill publicly. Some of you might be a bit confused by this. Shouldn't Disney have picked a side? Why is he trying to do both? Money. Do you want to know what the difference is between money gained from a fascist and money gained from an anti-fascist? The person who gives it you. That's it. One dollar is one dollar. Pays the same no matter who it comes from. We live in an economic system called capitalism, and the basis of capitalism, to boil it down to its absolute basics, is that trade and industry are controlled by private owners explicitly for the purpose of making money, rather than by a country itself or to fulfill a social need. Take public transportation, for example. Let's say that there are two towns that could be connected by a train and that this would serve a social utility. However, it would not be a particularly profitable venture, or that another more profitable venture is found between two towns which already have multiple train lines. Therefore, under capitalism, the train is much less likely to be built because the incentive structure and structure of all of society is around the acquisition of wealth. Capitalists don't care who they get it from or what they have to do to get it. Disney is a corporation. Its goal under capitalism, before anything else, is to make money. Everything else comes secondary to that. In the United States, Republicans are extremely pro-capitalism. Most parties are, but Republicans will defend the rights of corporations to do literally whatever they want, as long as it aligns with their political interests, up to and including destroying the planet. The reason for this is simple. In a capitalist society, if you have money, you have power. Disney has in Florida a region called Reedy Creek, where they essentially act as the governing body. If you've been to Disney World Orlando, you've been to Reedy Creek. Up until Disney voiced opposition to the bill, Republicans have been perfectly okay with them doing basically whatever they wanted there. Democrats, the opponents of Republicans, weren't, as a series of incidents which went unpunished or even looked into showed that Disney didn't actually govern particularly well and that Reedy Creek almost acts like a company town. 
Disney funded Ron DeSantis and numerous other supporters of the Don't Say Gay bill because they assumed that this would mean that their autonomy would be unimpeded. Point 11 then shows that this autonomy would indeed be impeded. In April 2022, the Florida legislature under the control of the Florida Republicans and Ron DeSantis, while accusing Disney of being part of some woke conspiracy or something, abolished Reedy Creek's special status. At the time of this video's publication, this law hasn't been put into place yet, so it's supposed to go into effect in June 2023. Fun side note on that one though, the Reedy Creek Institution has over $1 billion of debt, which will now be spread across the various counties across the state of Florida, essentially meaning that the state is economically crippled. I guess Ron went so anti woke he fell asleep and forgot his job was to make sure that he improved the lives of Floridians, not make them incomprehensibly worse. Nice one, Ronnie. Slight update as I record here because, of course, as soon as I decide to work on this, the first thing to come out of the situation in months happens, alright? It seems Ron might have to go back on this. Because, of course he has to. Disney is the state's biggest employer, what did he think was going to happen? He's got some concessions from Disney, but they're totally meaningless. Such as Disney is not allowed to build a nuclear power plant on their theme park. What a shame. Just for fun, I thought we'd go over some of the things that Ron DeSantis is known for. Attempting to create a private army in Florida. Human trafficking immigrants to Martha's Vineyard. Lying about there being places for them. And then attacking Democrats and Martha's Vineyard for not being able to house them. And sending them to the correct facilities to document their immigration to the USA. Telling his allies to say nothing when Trump was found to have had a dinner with neo-Nazis. Just being Republican in general is noteworthy of criticism as far as I'm concerned. Being found to have helped torture of prisoners in Guantanamo Bay while acting as a military lawyer. Just straight up helping torture people for literally no reason. My second favourite because it shows how much of an unambiguously and intentionally malicious lunatic he is. Appointing someone who dressed up as a member of the Ku Klux Klan, a group which is known for terrorising minorities including chasing them down, stripping them, covering them in burning tar and throwing feathers onto them, as the governor of the one district in the entire state of Florida which is majority non-white. And my personal favourite, because if the last one didn't do it for you, Florida, recently under DeSantis, is systematically banning care for trans youth, and when told that this would lead to trans children dying, they responded with, that's fine. They are literally telling you, directly, to your face, that they are trying to kill you. There does come a point where I have to stop, because if I keep adding in new shit he does, this video will never be released. This is some great company you've been keeping, by the way, Disney. You didn't think to vet them at all? Check their policies, make sure they weren't literally homicidal maniacs. Listen to what they were saying. Literally any research. But I mean, hey, Grimwalkers could possibly be considered a trans allegory, so that's basically the same thing as not being murdered, right? Point 12. The release of the Lumity date on Disney's YouTube channel, and oh boy, I could go off on this one for a while, but hey, look at the description. How cute, they use the term that shippers use sometimes instead of Lumity. Yeah, you do realise that this means that they keep an eye on fandom spaces, right? Like they're watching to see how you react to them screwing you over. That That's what this means. Point 12 is the airing of season 3 of the Owl House and then point 13 is the end of its airing. For everything that I've said here, the world is moving in a more pro-LGBT mind state. It's weird to think about given the state of the world at times, but we're the ones that are winning. Our opponents are getting louder, that doesn't mean that they're winning. I dream of a world where the term LGBTQIA plus is outdated because all of it is so normalised and accepted that the idea of it needing its own category is utterly incomprehensible to people. That's the world I dream of, and on the off chance that someone is watching this from 500 years in the future, I hope you're confused, because if you are, then that means that humanity is doing pretty dang well. Getting to that point on the capitalism, however, is an exceptionally difficult process. A major reason why more media isn't openly pro-LGBT is due to the various nations like Russia and China refusing to air it. And it isn't just Disney either. Take Bethesda, for example. During Pride Month, they'll show you their online social media icons with the Pride flag. In the West. In the Middle East, they won't. I wonder if it has something to do with the treatment of LGBT people there and them wanting to sell their products there. You might think it sounds a little bit conspiratorial too, and to an extent, sure, you could say that. Although, do you remember that episode of Gravity Falls that I talked about in my first video? It was the Love God one, the one where I talked about how the episode had a bunch of progressive iconography removed from it, and while that episode is a roofy implied god-awful mess, which in hindsight I'm glad no progressive iconography is associated with, I didn't tell you why it was removed. Turns out, that had a payoff. Believe me, I'm as surprised as you are, I forgot about this until now. See, Alex Hirsch, the creator of Gravity Falls and creative consultant of the Owl House, the glorious bastard, has gone on to state his belief that the pursuit of profit from nations such as Russia and China are primary reasons that are specified here, and has released email exchanges that he has had 
with Disney that confirmed their efforts to sense the progressive tendencies of Gravity Falls. A dollar is a dollar after all, whether it comes from a neo-Nazi or a homosexual. This is why I believe that those overseers that Dinah Terrace mentioned cutting Owl House's third season exist. Because it didn't fit the Disney brand. That brand being what will make them as much money as possible so they can sell it in every country that they can by being as safe and toothless as you can possibly imagine. No offence caused even towards snowflake genocidal fascists. And that's why if you look at the posters of the new Star Wars series, Finn over here is made much smaller in the posters that are sent out to China. Because the existence of a black man is offensive to China. Apparently, for some bizarre reason. I don't know about you, but I'm starting to notice a bit of a pattern starting to emerge here of various groups being tossed aside in the pursuit of cash. I've seen people talk about this post by Dana, by the way, as if it somehow disproved that the LGBT stuff was the reason that Disney cancelled the show because of this paragraph here. No, it doesn't. What it proves is that Disney was smart enough not to say that out loud this time. They were with Gravity Falls, remember? Be reasonable. After the Owl House got immense praise and ratings from having LGBTQ themes, if Disney had then come forward and said, yes, because this is costing us money with China and Russia, and also because we want to still get money from Republicans, we are now cancelling the Owl House. Do you think that would have gone down well? Do you honestly think that that would have been seen as remotely acceptable? Of course it wouldn't. It would be the biggest PR hit that they had ever seen. This didn't disprove that LGBTQIA plus themes were the reason it was cancelled. It proves that they were smart enough not to say it was. Everything I've said here can of course be overcome if given enough time and effort, but under capitalism it becomes a much more difficult process. Under capitalism, profit always takes priority, and ideas like human rights, dignity, and equality come second. And this is why the Owl House isn't getting a full third season. Politics and capitalism. In a word, a miscalculation. Here's what I think happened. Disney thought that the Republicans would support Reedy Creek's existence regardless of anything, and then the Republicans pushed a don't say gay bill. Disney, after it was discovered that they had been funding various Republicans, spoke out against it, hoping to score a public relations win in order to abet critique. They wanted both a PR win and to maintain Reedy Creek's status, but when it became clear that they wouldn't get both, only then did they decide to take a stand against the Republicans. And as if to prove everything I've said before any of this happened, they removed the same-sex kiss from the movie Lightyear, only putting it back in after all of this happened. Fear of upsetting their Republican buddies, but since they're upset anyway, they might as well try and score a win with the broader public. It has nothing to do with supporting these groups. When a company does do this stuff, it's good, don't get me wrong. But they don't give a shit about the actual issue. They care about marketing their products, a growing demographic of progressives. That's it. There is nothing else to it. It's money. Plain and simple. It's ironic, really. Had the Owl House's first season been released in 2022 as opposed to 2020, we could have possibly seen a full third season due to the controversy forcing Disney away from the Republicans, and DeSantis in particular. Instead, though, they'll destroy the third season of the Owl House, but the latter made a cute little one minute loomity there for YouTube. Not the show, mind you, but on YouTube, because your money is just as good as the Republicans. That's just good business. That's in the corporation's interest. That's capitalism. But don't worry though, just wait until 2030. I'm sure that they'll apologise for not taking a stronger stand, just like they did with women's suffrage back in the day, which they make up for on International Women's Day, or the civil rights marches, which they make for in Black History Month. Or like they did with complacency and workplace abuses that they make up for by supporting the Me Too movement, just like they will do here, and then the next social issue, and the next, and the next, and the next, and the next, and new controversy will arise, and they they don't think it will be profitable, they'll let it roll on over, because once again, ad infinitum, until progressives inevitably become the dominant political bloc. Let me make this as utterly, blatantly clear for you as I can possibly make it. Corporations like Disney do not care about you at all. They will send you to the gas chamber for a few extra bucks because they think they can get away with it. And I know that that's what they'll do because they already did it. Whether you were a racial minority, a gender or LGBT minority, or we jumped 200 years into the future having green eyes or whatever arbitrary insane bullshit makes you a political minority because it's all equally arbitrary and made up anyway, you are a walking wallet to them. And by appealing to you, they hope that they can get your money while also funding the people who want you dead so they can get their money too. That is what happened to the first season of the Owl House. And that is why Hunter as a character failed and why the Owl House's second season 
and the first season were so lacking. Had none of this happened, Hunter could have been a fully fleshed out character and his relationships with others wouldn't have been so forced and perhaps more importantly, Willow wouldn't have been treated like absolute garbage. If you like Hunter, you should be with me on this. You've been robbed of your favourite character's full arc and I was robbed of a character that I might have ended up liking and both for the exact same reason. If you've watched my previous video or you're watching this video in the future and you thought that you check out my historiography, you might notice a very different tone here than in my other videos. This one seems to be more of an unstructured rant, right? The editing is lesser and the points are less structured. Yeah, I noticed that too. There is a reason for that. I've been working on this video for months now and I've not been happy with it and that's kept putting me off working with it. I've had work, job hunts, other projects, no manner of things to work on, but if I had really wanted to, I could have put the time aside to make this video a lot sooner. And I realized recently that I'm not going to ever be happy with this script or this video because I'm not having fun with it. All it does is make me angry and depressed. Maybe it's because I have in part learned that my passion and strength comes from analyzing media itself and not the world outside of them necessarily. But this was one of those videos that I felt if I didn't make, I'd kick myself for. The first video I was running on pure hatred for. And at the time of this video going up, it's my best performing video and what I'm quite proud of. It seems weird to follow that up with one that I think it's easily my worst, but that's why. One comment I got from someone is that they were interested in my reaction to calling it that Hunter was going to be possessed, and the fact that I basically called everything right in my various analyses of the show. Do you want to know what my honest opinion was? It was... Oh. That entire scene I felt should have been a big moment of triumph that finally wrapped up Hunter's character arc from villain to hero, but I frankly can't even muster up the energy to pretend to be surprised. Because of course that was what was going to happen. Like I kept saying, Hunter is 100% good, so in 100% of his various incarnations of the Grimwalker, was I supposed to be surprised at the strength of his moral character? Of him overcoming this great obstacle he's overcome hundreds of times and standing up to Belos? Am I supposed to care? Like, seriously, how am I supposed to care about this great moment when you've told me he's all but predestined to do this? Maybe I would have cared, Grimwalker and all, if there had been the time to properly develop him. But there wasn't so I couldn't care less. I wanted season 2 and 3 of this should be magnificent. I tried so hard to get into the spirit of things. I watched the episodes as they came out. I watched the live streams that showcased the episodes. I tried my hardest to like Hunter in these seasons, but as time has gone on, I've just had to come to the conclusion that I don't like season 2. Season 3 is better, and I think the creators did the best that they could with what they had, but it suffered immensely due to the third season's butchering. And I just find it depressing, to be honest with you. And I'm not going to stand here and pretend that I'm enjoying this, or that I don't know exactly why this happened. And I find it more depressing that people will bend over backwards to praise this show in spite of it, and not say a word about what Disney has actually done. People have been screwed over and barely even seem to realise it, and Disney gets to run off into the night to do it all over again. Do you want to know what the Owl House is to Disney? Well, it is deep down. It's its Uno reverse card, a way that they can say, how can we fund homophobia? We have a show of LGBT main characters. Just ignore the fact that they butchered it and that Hunter, a white straight coded guy, then became the main character. Not even through his or the creator's fault, but because that was the only way that they could wrap this show up in an even half decent state. And that they did all of this in the hopes of appeasing openly genocidal fascists. Owl House comes from what I call the Gravity Falls family, a series of shows that were made by people who worked on Gravity Falls and took major influence from it. Amphibia is one such show, so is the Owl House, so is Star vs. the Forces of Evil or Inside Job, that kind of thing. If you were to ask me which one of these shows I think is the best, my answer would be Amphibia. I'd say that Owl House is my favourite, but I think that it's one of the worst made, and it ended up that way through no fault of its own. Season 1 was so good, it became a hyperfixation of mine for years. And to see it treated this way is just depressing. There are many issues I have with the Owl House, and Hunter, basically as a character in his entirety, I despise beyond words. In the current era, English is considered the language with the most words, but even it doesn't have enough for me to convey how much I hate Hunter. From how he's taken the spotlight away from every character I grew to love, how the show insists upon him being the most special person in existence, to his entire arc of redemption feeling like a personal slap in the face. One of the things I had to cut from this video was the fact that I heavily relate to Hunter. Because I've undergone my own struggles with the far right, and I came out of it as a full-blown anarchist. I relate to Hunter. I don't want to hate him. 
but his entire arc lacks any of the nuance or ability to convey what that experience is really like. I don't want to be this angry at the state of the Owl House. All the pieces are there. I still remember Labyrinth Runners. I remember Hunter saying he knows he's been lied to, but he still wants to believe he was doing the right thing. I know that the people involved had the right idea in their minds, but were screwed over in such a harsh way that my anger is more towards what happened than at the show itself. And yet I watch people who just ignore or are completely ignorant to all of this because what? There might be a trans allegory in there somewhere? Because LGBT themes were in the story at all? And they just ignore the fact that those themes are why Disney screwed over the show only after it fought that they could make more money from the people who want to kill them, only to now come crawling back when they realise they couldn't. I'm frustrated, I'm angry, and I'm depressed, and I feel bad for the creators who did everything in their power to avoid this. This defence of the show doesn't help. I'm sorry, but it doesn't. It is possible to defend this show from the scum of the earth conservatives for its themes, but also to go after the corporation that signed its death for those themes too. I want to tell a quick story about fandoms and their relationship to corporations. Let me tell you about Pokemon Sword and Shield. Pokemon Sword and Shield is a game, and that's the nicest thing that could be said about it, frankly. It's very, very bad compared to other entries in the Pokemon series. More limited, less content, and constant lies upon lies from Nintendo and Game Freak. This angered a lot of people. One of the rallying cries was bring back the national decks. This was something that took these companies two weeks to acknowledge. But then another post started making the rounds. Thank you, Game Freak, which was intended to show appreciation to the workers who had been making the game. This was acknowledged mere hours after it started trending, and this told Game Freak that what they did didn't matter. People would defend them no matter what. I'm reminded of that when it comes to the Owl House now, only for LGBT characters. Incidentally, Amphibia and the Owl House both have LGBT characters. Do you want to know what the difference is between them, though? Amphibious LGBT characters knew their fucking place and kept their mouth shut about it. And by sheer chance, that's the one that got the third full season, even though it performed worse than the Owl House. And that's when the LGBT themes in Amphibia became open, because at that point they had nothing to lose. Because that way you can tell to both the progressives and the conservatives. And that's just good business. That's capitalism. And people have the fucking nerve to ask me why I'm an anti-capitalist. And for the final time, when I say corporation, I mean corporation, not the creators. I don't blame the creators of Amphibia for this, nor the creators of the Owl House. Owl House just played its hand and that's what happened to it. I pray that somehow, someday, the creators are able to reclaim the copyrights of the Owl House. Or that the executives that didn't are massively shaken up. Or something that allows the Owl House to be continued or expanded upon, or even remade. Maybe some expanded universe stuff, like what Gravity Falls did with the Lost Legends book. I don't normally like it when character vital information is hidden in other media, but at this point, I'll take what I can get when it comes to Hunter. Or maybe hundreds of years down the line. When the copyright dies off on its own, or it's sold or something, that someone will look back and understand what made this show what it was in season 1, but it failed to be in its follow-up seasons. Maybe one of those will get rid of Hunter. Better still. Maybe that version will make a version of Hunter that I love. Although admittedly at the time of publication I think I'd prefer you just fuck off, but hey. And no hunt low, none of this. I feel like war crimes, kidnapping, lies, manipulation, betrayal and everything else is probably the absolute literal worst way to do any sort of relationship of any kind. If you have to work so 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 hard to make that one work, maybe completely change how they met and maybe, as of right now though, put it with literally anyone else. I still vote Skara. Might, might have fallen to the rare pair rabbit hole on that one. I don't want to leave this off on a depressing note, though. I'm an incredibly optimistic person at my core. Every time I look at humanity, I see such crisp, indescribable potential. The current day is full of many problems, but one day in the future we will overcome them. And someday after that, we will have solved these problems for longer than we as a species ever had them. Maybe we'll live to see that world. Maybe we won't. But it's a goal worth working towards no matter what. And there's a million small things that can be done to help get to that world. Be it learning a trade that contributes to the betterment of mankind, to making your support for egalitarianism no, to just voting progressives into office, to small things like sharing and liking and spreading the word of content and shows and essays and the likes to people who need to hear it. That wasn't a hint to do that for my videos, by the way. I meant other content creators, though. And again, if you feel like doing that for my stuff, I shouldn't say no. 
Please subscribe. Don't allow the Owl House's legacy and what it's paved the road for others to do to be in vain. Support shows with progressivism in them. If you're a creative and want to try your hand at making a show, a comic, or anything, try it. We have nothing to lose and potentially everything to gain. Outdo the Owl House. Make it better. Make it more impactful. Don't just lament it. Build upon it. Because that way, you make the idea of bringing back the Owl House more likely and failing that, making its downfall and destruction mean something. Maybe that's a cold comfort to some, but sometimes that's all you get. Our House played its hand early in the hopes that others wouldn't get cut down. When corporations make media with these sorts of elements and themes to them, it's good. But don't ever for a second believe that they're doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. And when they do shit like this, never let them, or more importantly, anyone who consumes products from them ever forget it. All I'll leave you with in regards to that is the question. Compared to everyone who works at Disney, the 200,000 workforce, against a couple of executives who decide the brand of Disney. Who would you prefer make the call? The people who work on the shows, or the people who don't? If you'd prefer the former, then you're in good company, comrade. That's kind of it for the analytical portion of this series. The next one will be something very different. I'll be going over various ways I think Hunter could have been written into a vastly better character. I'm not even going to pretend to know when that one's going to come out. I have quite a number of projects to work on and responsibilities and the like that need to be addressed. But I figured that to wrap this video up, it might be nice to give a preview as to what my next big project will be. Not necessarily which one will come out next, but what I think the next big project I have will be. I want to thank you all for watching. If you found this interesting or enjoyable or informative, then please do be sure to leave a like on the video. It does help out an insane amount. Consider subscribing too, I've got a number of projects in the works that I'm looking forward to. Speaking of which, here's a trailer for that next big project. The wisdom of our creed is revealed through these words. We work in the dark, to serve the light. We are assassins. Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. If everything is permitted, no one is safe. What is it the Templars truly seek? Order. Purpose. Direction. No more than that. In the end, it all comes down to freedom. We seek it, they detest it. But if they knew the truth of it, that all we seek is peace. Freedom is peace. Oh, no. It's an invitation to chaos. And so there's never an end to the fight. Not until one side is completely gone.